This event is the third and final panel discussion on the National Academy's sexual harassment report. We held panels at the College of Engineering and the College of LSNA last month. I'd like to thank our colleagues for collaborating with ERWIG to bring you this event today. The University of Michigan Office of Research, the Advanced Program, and Michigan Medicine's Office for Health Equity and Inclusion. We're fortunate, as you'll see, to have two presidents with us today. Our own president, the first physician scientist to lead our institution, will start off our discussion today. Dr. Mark Schlissel, the 14th president of the University of Michigan. Uh, thanks, Anna, for the introduction. It, it's funny, I was thinking as she was telling everyone to s silence their cell phones, the last time I spent a lot of time in a health system, it was silence your pagers. So I'm dating myself and my uh, distance uh, as the years go by from clinical medicine. Uh, but I'd like to also extend a special welcome to Wellesley College uh, President Paula Johnson, who's graciously agreed to join us today and uh, share her knowledge and her perspective. Uh, we're actually both 14th presidents of our respective institutions. So if you believe in numerology, it's something propitious. Uh, and I'm really grateful uh, for her outstanding contributions to this study and to higher education more generally. Uh, I also want to express uh, my utmost appreciation to all of you for taking time out of your a day to come and engage with this very important uh, work and important topic for us, for all of us. Uh, preventing all forms of sexual misconduct is a top priority for the U of M's leadership team and our Board of Regents. And I also think it's a shared responsibility for everybody at our institution. Uh, this includes encouraging reporting, supporting survivors, and having a zero tolerance for acts of retaliation. Uh, we care very deeply about this issue and we share a commitment to be able to look each other in the eye and say that we simply won't tolerate these types of behaviors at the University of Michigan. Uh, although we have a longstanding and focused prevention efforts and education programs, we're absolutely committed to um, uh, developing approaches that will serve our university community even more effectively in the future. We're examining our procedures to see where we can improve reporting, accountability, and support for those who come forward. Uh, I'm proud that top University of Michigan faculty members are contributing their considerable expertise to help us better address sexual misconduct and making that expertise available to others. Our university was well represented on the National Academies Committee that undertook this work. Three University of Michigan professors helped to produce the report on sexual harassment of women climate, culture, and consequences uh, in academic sciences, engineering, and medicine. So thank you, a special thank you to, to uh, Lilia Cortina, Tim Johnson, and of course, Anna Kirkland. Uh, this report's already making a difference on our three campuses and in Michigan medicine. Our working group on faculty st and staff sexual misconduct used the study as they developed their recommendations for our own university. The group included faculty and staff uh, experts on sexual misconduct from all across our university. Uh, there were significant alignments between the study and the group's efforts and it enhanced the members' understanding and helped them develop their recommended path forward. Uh, the initial steps we've taken include a centralized website devoted to sexual misconduct reporting, uh, prevention and education that can be easily accessed by all members of the community on our main homepage and via other popular university websites. We're also developing a comprehensive sexual misconduct training and education approach for all faculty and staff, and this training will be mandatory for the first time. And there, these are just two examples of our current efforts. Uh, we're currently evaluating how we will implement additional aspects of the group's work, including a second phase on developing an equitable and inclusive workplace environment to diminish the frequency of misconduct. To be as thorough as possible, we've also asked an outside expert to conduct a broader examination of our policies, procedures, and practices around sexual misconduct, assess the quality of our current efforts, and suggest things we might be doing better. Uh, this work is ongoing, and it's incorporating conclusions from this study as well, and we'll have more to say about this as we get their report. Uh, three years ago, we completed a survey uh, of students on our Ann Arbor campus about their experiences with sexual misconduct. Uh, this was part of our vow to undertake a thorough, transparent, and honest self-examination uh, of sexual misconduct that affects our students. 
Our goal was to gain a deep understanding and produce rigorous and actionable data so we could devise better ways to prevent misconduct and address its consequences. Information this thorough and with this level of detail had never been gathered before at our university. Like we see in the study being presented today, there are serious truths in the data that we must work together to address. I've heard many painful stories from survivors of sexual assault. They've shared with me what they went through and have asked for our help. I thank everyone who is helping us create a safer and more equitable university for all. So thank you. It's now my pleasure to introduce Lilia Cortina, one of the leading national experts I mentioned previously. Uh, Dr. Cortina is a professor of psychology, women's studies and management at the University of Michigan and co-director of our advanced program that promotes diversity and excellence amongst our faculty. Uh, please help me welcome Professor Lilia Cortina. Wonderful, thank you. So my role this afternoon is to tell you more about the key findings from this report. So this was a consensus study report authored by a 21 person committee made up of sexual harassment experts, scientists, engineers, physicians, legal scholars, college presidents, and the former Congresswoman. And the committee was charged with reviewing the scientific Re, uh, record on the sexual harassment of women in STEM and academic medicine. So in other words, how much does sexual harassment happen? What are its effects? And what can we do about it? So I'll take a few, a few moments just to highlight some key findings and key recommendations. Uh, but I invite you to visit the report's website for more details and to download the actual report itself. And the website is listed at the bottom of the slide and in your program. So the committee relied on standard social science definitions of sexual harassment, which cover the full range of conduct that real people face in real workplaces and schools. So broadly speaking, this refers to behavior that derogates, demeans, or humiliates an individual based on sex. So the behavior can be further subdivided into three categories. Sexual coercion refers to implicit or explicit attempts to make the conditions of employment or education contingent upon sexual cooperation. So this would be the prototypical sleep with me or you're fired kind of situation. So this is often the first thing that comes to people's minds when they hear the term sexual harassment, but we know from research it's actually the rarest form that this behavior takes. Related to sexual coercion is unwanted sexual attention which is exactly what it sounds like. Unwanted touching, groping, stroking, forcible kissing, repeated requests for dates or sexual behavior despite discouragement. And unwanted sexual attention can and sometimes does include sexual assault. Most sexual harassment, however, falls into the third category, uh, gender harassment. And this refers to conduct that conveys hostility, exclusion or second class status about women. So for example, comments that denigrate women as dumb blondes who can't cut it in engineering, dumb sluts who don't belong in surgery, dumb cunts who are taking jobs away from better qualified men. And if you find it upsetting to hear language like that in a scientific setting, then you have some insight into what it feels like to be on the receiving end of that language. So imagine hearing it coming from your colleagues, your supervisor, your students. So gender harassment is not about sex or sexual conquest. Instead, it's about contempt. All three forms of sexual harassment can be, can be illegal. But in many cases, the formal law would not cover the conduct that is nonetheless damaging to women in their work. And it's likely that the legal environment surrounding Title IX will shift as the DeVos environment, a DeVos administration <laughs> issues new rules. And of course, we have to comply with the law but the law in this area should be regarded as a floor, not a ceiling. So we have to figure out as a campus community how to combat all the forms that sexual harassment takes, including those not reached by the formal law. So you can think about the different forms of sexual harassment as a sort of iceberg. So unwanted sexual attention, sexual coercion, and sexual assault are at the very top. So those are the behaviors that break through the public view, that make it into the news, that are widely recognized as impermissible sexual harassment. 
Those are also the behaviors that tend to be the focus of many institutions' policies, procedures, and trainings surrounding sexual harassment. But the research record is clear. More often than not, sexual harassment is a put down, not a come on. So the bulk of the iceberg, as you see here, consists of gender harassment. So it's conduct that demeans, derogates, humiliates people based on gender. And the gender harassing conduct is submerged in the image because many people just don't realize that it is a form of sexual harassment. So sometimes it's tempting to assume a continuum of severity within these various acts of abuse. So is it the case that verbal sexual overtures are never as bad as physical ones? Are the worst offenses those that turn sexual, if not serial? In contrast, are sexist jokes and insults sort of no big deal? Our committee reviewed the evidence and found that none of these assumptions hold up to scientific scrutiny. So according to research, even when sexual harassment entails nothing but sexist insult without any unwanted sexual pursuit, it takes a toll on victims. We further found that sexual harassment in the academy is alarmingly common. So to illustrate, these are incidence rates uh, at a large public university in the Midwest, not Michigan, but a place a lot like University of Michigan. And you can see here on the left side that 37% of female faculty and staff at this university reported no harassment in the past two years but 63% had encountered at least one variant of sexually harassing conduct. So that's more than six in 10 female faculty and staff. Most of these experiences involved some kind of gender harassment, which are represented here in the different shades of blue. 4% of the situations also included sexual coercion. Likewise, we found through analyses of survey data that 20 to 50% of students are sexually harassed by their faculty or staff members. Again, to illustrate, these are findings from uh, women students at a large public university, this one in the Southwest. And we compared the experiences of women pursuing degrees in the sciences versus engineering versus medicine versus other fields. And what we found was that there were no differences across fields in the rates of unwanted sexual attention which are re represented here in the small gold bars. And there were no differences in sexual coercion, which are the very small uh, red bars. The rates of gender harassment, however, did vary by discipline. In particular, medical students experienced significantly more gender harassment than students in other fields. As well, students in engineering faced higher rates of sexist gender harassment, which are the bars in orange, compared to students in the sciences and the students outside of STEM. So evidence such as this led our committee to recommend that academic institutions pay more attention to gender harassment. So we need to take gender harassment seriously in our policies, our procedures, our penalties for policy violation. So this is by far the most common form that sexual harassment takes and prevention of gender harassment could potentially help in the prevention of other types of sexually harassing conduct. The research record also makes clear that sexual harassment takes a toll on the health and well being of its victims. For example, one study found that one in five sexually harassed women meets clinical criteria for major depressive disorder, and one in 10 meets criteria for post traumatic stress disorder. In addition, dozens of studies have shown that sexual harassment derails women's work lives. Sexually harassed faculty find their jobs less satisfying and more stressful. Many of them engage in some form of withdrawal, meaning that they disengage from their work, or worse, they leave to take positions elsewhere, or they leave academia entirely. And the picture looks just as bleak for women students who encounter sexual harassment. So their paths through college veer off as they take various measures to avoid sexist conduct and unwanted sexual pursuit. We also found that one need not be directly targeted with sexual harassment to feel its effects because the circle of harm extends to both witnesses, work groups, peer groups, others around the sexually harassed individual or group. So in other words, when women are sexually harassed, women leave, their coworkers leave, 
even the men leave. They don't stick around to watch their colleagues be disparaged, and they certainly don't want to become the next target. So all employees and all students, regardless of gender, suffer from spending time in sexist or degrading or misogynistic environments. So the bottom line is that the cumulative effect of sexual harassment is a significant and costly loss of talent. And this is true in every academic field, not limited to STEM or academic medicine. Our committee also recognized that sexual harassment is a complex phenomenon intersecting with racism, homophobia, transphobia, and other discriminatory mindsets. For example, women of color often encounter a so-called double whammy of discrimination rooted in both gender and ethnic prejudice. Likewise, LGBT women frequently face harassment based on gender, sex, and sexuality. So in short, we found that women of color, lesbian and bisexual women, and trans women end up being harassed at significantly higher rates than their straight, white, cisgender counterparts. So the harmful effects are concentrated even more on them. So given the costs that come with sexual harassment, we need to figure out how to prevent it. So remember that sexual harassment is less about sex, more about contempt. So most often, it's a put down, not a come on. This means that rules and regulations surrounding sex and sexuality are not going to fix this problem. In fact, we found little evidence that interventions that are now commonplace in academia have actually had much effect in terms of reducing actual rates of harassing conduct. So typical policies assume that victims will report harassment formally and promptly without fear of retaliation. But we found from the, from the research record that these assumptions don't hold up to reality. So for many reasons, few people, female, male, or any other gender, ever reports the harassment they endure. So we need to think outside the box if we want to move the needle on this problem. We need to look beyond legalistic policies and trainings focused mostly on reporting and focused mostly on sexually threatening acts of abuse. Those acts simply don't happen without a firm foundation of disrespect and derision and devaluation of women. So we need to overhaul the institutional cultures and climates that enable dis disrespect to thrive. So the report offers a whole host of different recommendations for institutions of higher education. And you can read about some of them in the blue and yellow insert in your program, or I should say the maize and blue insert. Um, the National Academies were nice enough to use Michigan colors on this report, you'll notice. Uh, these happen to be the colors of the National Academies, apparently. But just to give you some examples of the kinds of recommendations the report includes. So our committee recommended that, recommends that academic institutions take steps to foster greater cooperation, respectful work behavior, and professionalism. So we recommend that these criteria factor into hiring and promotion decisions for faculty and staff. So ask yourself, do you make junior people run a gauntlet of abuse to show, you, to show their worth? Uh, do we do things like abrasively interrupt seminar speakers as an indicator of our own excellence? Do we have a star culture where some people are above the rules because they're just so brilliant or so famous or they bring in so many grant dollars? If so, these dynamics could potentially set the stage for sexual harassment. So to find out what's going on in your own department or your own unit, ask outside experts to survey or interview your faculty, students, and staff. In particular, ask those at the bottom of the formal hierarchy how they're treated, ensuring confidentiality so they can be candid about their experiences. So the report also recommends providing better support for targets. So regardless of whether someone files a formal complaint, they should have access to legal services, to health care, to career and professional services. There should be alternative and less formal ways of recording information about incidents without pressure to report them formally. And for those individuals who do choose to come forward and file a report, there should be better ways of protecting them from feeling re-victimized by the process or retaliated against as a result of speaking out. In addition, accountability and transparency are paramount. So we need to make clear that people will be held accountable for violating sexual harassment policy. So there should be a clear and escalating range of disciplinary actions 
And those actions should not be something that are a benefit. So for example, faculty getting reduced teaching after they've harassed someone is not a good idea. Uh, academic institutions should also be as transparent as possible about how they're handling reports of sexual harassment. There are issues of confidentiality at play here, but it's possible to create aggregate level reports that protect people's identities, but summarize for the community the sorts of issues that are coming up, both formally and informally, and the sorts of actions that are being taken in response. And finally, our committee recommends that academic training models move away from long-standing traditions of hierarchy and dependency between faculty and trainees. So we found good examples of this at some universities, which are starting to use mentoring networks, uh, committee-based advising, departmental funding models, rather than having graduate students and postdoctoral fellows entirely dependent on individual faculty for their funding and their success. So to bring life to some of these recommendations, the National Academies created a short two-minute video, which we'll play now. Um, and it's also available on the National Academies website and on YouTube, if you're interested. And Heidi, I might need your help getting it. There we go. So now you have just heard a 300-page report summarized in a short, sweet 15 minutes. I still encourage you to go to the website and read the report in all of its, its detail. Um, but at this point, I'm going to invite our three panelists to come to the stage, uh, and they'll each share some remarks. And as they're coming up, I will let you know who they are. Uh, Paula Johnson, as you've heard, is president of Wellesley College, and she has led in the field of women's health taking an approach to biology that integrates insights from sociology, economics, and many other fields. A cardiologist, uh, President Johnson was the Grace A. Young Family Professor of Medicine in the field of women's health at Harvard Medical School. And she was also Professor of Epidemiology at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. And she co-chaired the uh, committee that wrote the report. Next to her is Reshma, Reshma Jagsi. She's a professor, deputy chair, and residency program director in our Department of Radiation Oncology. And she's also the director for our Center for Bioethics and Social Sciences in Medicine. And her social scientific research includes research into the issues of bioethics related to cancer care, 
as well as gender equity, including studies of women's representation in the medical profession, challenges, and supportive interventions. And she's also an active clinical trialist and health services researcher, focusing on improving the quality of care received by breast cancer patients. And then finally, Tim Johnson served as chair of obstetrics and gynecology and was the Bates Professor of Diseases of Women and Children at Michigan from 93 to 2017. And he remains a Thurnau Professor, uh, Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology and Women's Studies, and a research professor at the Center for Human Growth and Development. Uh, Dr. Johnson is an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine, and his research interests are fetal behavior and assessment, principles of prenatal care, global health, ethics, and international academic capacity building. Um, and I will turn the floor over to them at this point. So I believe Reshma is going to start things off. It's really a privilege to be here with you and part of this esteemed panel. Um, it's wonderful to see our institutional leadership turning out for this event and organizing this. Um, so I'm just going to spend a few moments um, uh, focusing on sexual harassment in academic medicine specifically. So one of the most striking findings of the National Academy's report was the striking uh, prevalence of sexual harassment um, experienced by medical students. As you can see, um, female medical students were 220 percent more likely than students from non-STEM disciplines to have experienced sexual harassment by faculty faculty or staff. And when I've been interviewed by journalists about this, they've asked me if I find this surprising. And I say that sobering is the word that I would choose rather than surprising because uh, decades of research led by Professor Cortina and her colleagues have demonstrated that there are certain characteristics of environments that predispose towards sexual harassment. And one of those is underrepresentation of women. And I don't just mean in terms of numbers, but I mean it, it, in terms of power across all levels of seniority. And we know that in academic medicine, although women finally exceeded uh, men in terms of matriculants to medical students, Student, uh, uh, classes in 2017, um, that 40% of the faculty are female, but only 16% of the deans and 16% of the department chairs who um, hold the power in those organizations. And so I've been researching this issue um, as part of some of my research that began over a decade ago, trying to understand women's underrepresentation in these senior leadership positions, and uh, actually as part of an R01 grant that actually looked at why women are ceasing to pursue careers in academic medicine and falling out of the pipeline. And one of the questions we asked was whether sexual harassment might be a mechanism. And the last good study that we found, as the National Academy's report kind of points out, there's a dearth of literature in academic medicine. The last good study we found had been done in 1995. And it was a cross-sectional um, study of faculty in 1995. Well, we know that women didn't really end up in medical schools until after Title IX in 1972. And so a cross-sectional faculty study in 1995 included a lot of women who went to medical school when the student body was vastly dominated by men. And so we thought, well, we'll replicate this study. We'll use the same questions, and we'll see if we can have some good news, show how things have gotten better. If we look at a Generation X cohort who went to school in the 1990s when women were over 40% of the medical school class. And yet, unfortunately, that's not what we found. What we found was that 30% of the women in our sample uh, were reporting that they had personally experienced harassment. And the specific question we asked was, in your professional career, have you encountered unwanted sexual comments, attention, or advances by a superior or colleague? Please note that we didn't include advances or attention from patients. Please also note that we asked that single question. And of course, behavioral scientists will tell us that if we had asked more questions about specific behaviors, that estimate would only be higher. So this is quite sobering. Um, the distribution of behaviors is very much as Professor Cortina outlined, with sexist remarks or behavior, the, the far, by far the most common experience, um, but a non-trivial minority experiencing these other forms of harassment as well. And the effect was non-trivial as well. So 59% of those who had been harassed perceived a negative impact on their confidence in themselves as professionals, and nearly half reported that these experiences had negatively affected their own career advancement. So after publishing this research, I received an outpouring of heartfelt emails. You don't have to read the whole email, but I will read part of it to you. Your paper struck a particular chord with me. I brushed what happened under the rug, and in a residency program where the chair invites the male and not the female residents and attendings over every week for poker, 
these things largely go unnoticed. Over the past four years, I've wondered if something was pathologically wrong with me that I invited this sort of behavior. Was it because I wasn't smart enough? Was it because I was soft-spoken? Was it because there was something so wrong with me that I couldn't even recognize it and whether it would keep me from achieving anything of merit? I hope institutions pay attention. I hope people care. I received so many emails like this, and I would email them back, and I would say, you know, there's a section in JAMA called A Piece of My Mind, and this is so eloquent, and it's so important for people to understand the rich, lived experiences of women who've gone through these experiences. Please write this. Please share this. And every time I got a response saying, you have got to be kidding me. I do not want to be victimized further. I don't want to be marginalized or stigmatized. I fear retaliation. I have invested everything I can into a medical career. Absolutely not. I'm not publishing that. But feel free to use my words if you can never find them to be of use. <laughs> so, easiest New England Journal perspective ever, I told their stories. And I have to say that this resonated far more than the dry statistics. Um, and one of the conclusions of this perspective was that we do need to do more and we need to draw inspiration from other fields. So leave it to academic astronomers to be super smart about this, right? And they discovered they had a problem with sexual harassment and they created something called the Astronomy Allies. And allies are just one example of interventions where we can equip bystanders to stand up, to become upstanders, this has been called. Um, and so that's one solution. And of course, I'm going to leave it to, to Dr. Johnson and Dr. Johnson to, um, I just realized that, Johnson and Johnson, <laughs> <laughs> to summarize other things that we can do. Um, but I want to close by saying um, that institutional responses absolutely do matter. And again, I'm sitting here and I'm looking out at this audience, and these are the leaders of our institution, all represented in one room. And Certainly another thing that Professor Cortina has found in her research is when you meta-analyze tens of thousands of subjects and you look at the strongest predictor of sexual harassment in an organization, it's the perception that the institution tolerates the behavior. And I'm very gratified to see that our leaders will not tolerate this behavior. And this is an example of another institution where they initially started off on the right foot and removed the physician found guilty of sexual harassment. And then they stumbled, and they, the family that had endowed the professorship that he held said, uh, we don't really want our family's professorship to be held by this individual. So they pulled the professorship, but they gave him a different one. And then that got announced as a, new vis as a new named professorship, and there was an outcry. And the heartening conclusion to this is that when over 1,000 members of that community signed a letter and petitioned um, that that honor be removed, uh, the institution then did respond appropriately. Um, I hope that we do recognize that institutions caring and institutions responding is critically important, and I look forward to hearing my co-panelists talk about exactly what we can do together. Oh, that one's you, right? Mm, yeah. Uh, so it's also my pleasure to be here. And I wanted to focus on the aspects of the report uh, that dealt with uh, specific issues around academic medical centers. Um, and uh, we, you've already heard that women students in academic medicine experience more frequent gender harassment perpetrated by faculty and staff than women in science and engineering. Uh, women students and trainees in Cairo are experiencing sexual harassment both perpetrated by faculty and staff, but also by other students and trainees. And so we need to think about kind of the different ways that, that this harassment can, uh, can flow. Uh, women faculty encounter or experience sexual harassment perpetrated by faculty and staff and also by students and trainees. And it's pretty clear also that women students, trainees, and faculty in academic medical centers experience sexual harassment by patients and patients' families, in addition to the harassment they experience from colleagues and those in leadership positions. And this is actually the big difference between academic medical centers and, uh, and science and, and, uh, and engineering, and that is that we basically run a hotel uh, where we have patients, uh, and that hotel has all the problems associated uh, with harassment that happen in, the, in those institutions as well. So we need to think about preparing medical students, uh, residents, and uh, faculty for this, uh, for this type of harassment. The two characteristics most associated with higher rates of sexual harassment are male-dominated gender ratios and leadership, and an organizational culture that communicates tolerance of sexual harassment. And this finding was something that we found over and over and over again as we reviewed the literature. Organizational climate is by far the greatest predictor of the occurrence of sexual harassment, 
and ameliorating it can prevent uh, people from sexually harassing, ha harassing others. But what, what does that mean? What are these characteristics? If you think about characteristics of all the academic medical centers that many of us have worked in, uh, they're highlighted here. The characteristics of organizations with a permissive climate towards sexual harassment include the following. Perceived risk to victims for reporting harassment, lack of sanctions against offenders, and the perception that one complaints will not be taken seriously. So it's pretty clear from the report that we felt that leadership at academic institutions had an important role to play and that much of the work needs to be a top-down uh, effort to focus on culture and harassment. But I want to just talk a little bit about what I think are also equally important bottom-up uh, efforts that we can have uh, to, to empower students, to empower residents, to empower new faculty members uh, to, uh, to uh, focus on this issue. Uh, this was a recent article that appeared in, in The Lancet uh, by scholars from our own uh, uh, Institute for Healthcare Policy and Initiative, and they talked about uh, sexual harassment and abuse when the patient is the perpetrator and had this algorithm, uh, do you feel safe? And then uh, clearly, in, uh, you know, what happens when you're harassed by a patient? Uh, first of all, clearly and firmly ask the patient to stop and then going down the algorithm. And this type of an algorithm is something that could be very easily uh, engaged in by students with CRLT players, with, uh, with, uh, uh, with, with uh, stations where they practice how to deal with the patient. Because in fact, most of us as medical students were, were professionalized to think that our patients loved us, to think that we owed our patients everything. And suddenly when you're faced with a patient who harasses you or, or reaches out and, and does something that's inappropriate, it's like a deer in the headlights. You've really not been prepared. So we need to actually talk to our medical students. We need to talk to our residents. We need to talk to new faculty members about dealing with not only this, this uh, patient and, and family harassment, but also the type of harassment that comes from faculty, from residents, and uh, from medical students. We need to prepare our learners uh, just as we prepare them to take a history and a physical to deal with this real life uh, uh, existence of sexual harassment and for them as learners to be part of the solution. Thanks, Tim. Um, I'm actually just going to sit here because I actually don't have slides and I'm just going to give some summary remarks about the importance of leadership. Um, I want to just begin by saying what a great honor it was to co-chair this committee and to have three members from the University of Michigan, which was truly extraordinary. And if I think about the three members um, and Dr. Jagsey's research and your president's commitment, you are truly set up to be the leading university in this area. And, um, and I don't say that lightly. Um, so um, thank you for, for everything that you've given, I think really to the, to the entire academic community with regard to the issue of sexual harassment in STEM in the academy. Lilia, I just do want to say to you that blue is Wellesley's color. We did allow, we did allow a little bit of yellow, but, um, but we share the blue. <laughs> so I just, you know, I think you've heard the, um, the clear message that leadership is critically important as we look to um, both eradicate and to prevent sexual harassment. And I think that this could not be overstated. Um, and we all know that in academic medicine, leadership is complex. You have your university president, you have your, at, at Michigan, you have your dean, you have your hospital CEO, and you have very powerful department chairs. So the traditional um, leadership model of shared governance in arts and sciences is really not the case in academic medicine. And we really have to understand how that dynamic works and how those different types of leadership work together to combat this issue and to change the culture. And I think it's important if we think about what, what uh, Dr. Johnson just said in terms of the next generation, our medical students as well as our trainees, I think we do have to own up to the fact that given the rates 
of harassment have not really changed and continue to be extraordinarily high in academic medicine, it means that we have produced people who have been harassers intergenerationally. And I think we have to take that very seriously and understand how we will break that cycle. So without a doubt, thinking about diversifying our leadership, diversifying our faculties, not just in pure numbers, but in power, is really going to be critically important. How do we also truly embrace a culture of diversity, inclusion, and true equity? And I think that it's one thing to populate by numbers, it's another thing to be inclusive and to really focus on equity. We know that today there still exists significant pay inequities um, for women. We know that there are inequities in any number of areas in spite of the numbers increasing for women. So, how do we think about the culture then of our institutions? And it requires, again, the partnership of all those levels of leadership to say that the future will look different. If we think about some of the areas that are critically important for, um, for changing the culture, one of the report's recommendations was thinking about creating, really focusing on creating um, strong, transparent policies. Now, what does that mean? Um, one area is really having a very clearly stated set of policies with clear ramifications, clear sanctions for those who are found in violation of sexual harassment policies. Now, that is easier said than done because coming up with some agreed upon structure is not easy to do when there's a complex, uh, a complex structure under which our organizations sit. But if the punishments, if the ramifications are not clear, then it's very hard to actually make clear how you will move forward to change the culture. Um, as we think about reporting, um, reporting, for example, on Title IX violations or, or how those have been dealt with, there's a strong recommendation that that becomes far more transparent. A good example of where it's being done well is at Yale. Um, Yale, if you go to their Title IX website, actually has, I think, some very good examples of the level of transparency that can be achieved in a larger university setting. And what it does is it makes clear that when reported, that those reports will be taken seriously, and it also clearly shares with the entire community in, an, in, in a way that is anonymous, and that's why it cannot be done in a small liberal arts college like mine because it's, it's too small, it would be clear who the individuals were. But it makes it very clear that if you do come forward to report, that it will be taken seriously and followed up. Again, we've talked um, about ensuring that there's a lack of retaliation against those who come forward to report. Again, a matter of culture but really in that, what is so important is creating the, the ethos that reporting is something that is courageous. We can't only de uh, depend on reporting because we know the vast majority of targets do not report, but for those who do come forward, the sense that this is something that is courageous to do is something that we can all participate in. Um, HR policies, another area where leadership truly makes a difference. One of our recommendations around policies for HR is that we do away with confidentiality agreements. When we are separating with those who have been found in violation, serious violation, that confidentiality agreements help to perpetuate the, um, the, the saga of those who have been found in violation onto other institutions. This is something that we as leaders in our institutions can work on very clearly. 
with our general counsels and a place that we can take, take this on. Another area would be um, how do we check references? Another area of HR policy. This can tend to be quite um, siloed in terms of what are the policies. The University of Wisconsin has actually taken on a very broad mandate to change the way that they do referencing in that those who are coming on to their faculty and staff actually sign a waiver. And in that waiver, it gives the school permission to ask about questions regarding harassment. So it's very clear what they will do and who they are going to question. So I think there are a number of areas where leadership across not only the academic aspects, but the policy aspects with regard to HR, with regard to our legal office, that frequently can really focus on issues much more from a compliance as opposed to culture change. And then I just want to end with our board of trustees. Whatever your board of trustees, there, there are boards of regents, there are boards of trustees. But I do think that as leaders of institutions, our boards of trustees are critically important. They're critically important for us as leaders to ensure that we are sharing the right information with them and that that information is taken to the highest level and that the board holds us accountable for how we are moving forward to change the culture, the climate, and to really decrease rates of sexual harassment in our institutions. So I'm just gonna end there. And um, I think there's so much more that is happening. There are organizations since the uh, release of the report, the AAAS, NSF, NIH, that have taken steps. Um, and I think that is only the beginning but we can move forward and hopefully in five years, we will be in a different place. So thank you. Thank you so much to our panelists. We now have uh, about 40 minutes for question and answer. We have mics moving around the room, so you can put your hand up if you would like to ask a question and I will try to see you through the very bright lights that are in our faces <laughs> up here. But uh, I will start things off with a question. So you all noted that unfortunately the data from the report singles out medical training sites as having higher levels of sexual harassment than other fields and disciplines. So can you offer some more detail and, and introspection about what explains that? And do we really need to rethink how we train doctors? So I, I think that uh, Part of, the, part of the increase has to do with the fact that there's a larger base of, of potential perpetrators with, with, with families and their patients. But I think the, the clear impression consistently with the, that it was a culture issue it has to do with the way we, we train people in teaching hospitals, the stress that's involved with teaching hospitals, uh, the long hours, uh, the fact that those long hours are happening in a place where there are call rooms, uh, where there are very high tension situations, where uh, where people can respond. It's pretty clear that a couple of areas, emergency medicine and the surgical specialties have been highlighted as, as uh, particularly high areas of, of, uh, of sexual harassment. Um, and, um, and so I think that's kind of the, the beginning. The second is kind of just the way we've trained people, the, the kind of uh, Socratic method we've used. Um, I remember as a medical student being talked to in very strange ways by faculty members in various departments. and. Uh, and, and the kinds of actions and things that we saw reflected kind of uh, uh, the fact that, you know, medical students weren't very smart. We were the bottom of the food chain. I mean, we have a pretty particular hierarchy. I mean, our medical students wear short coats and then our residents wear longer coats and our faculties wear really long coats. And, uh, and, and you know, what, what do those white coats mean? What kind of power do they, do, they, uh, do, they, do they give people? I think all those things are things that we need to think about. Uh, but I really think the key is that we need to kind of rethink the way we talk to our, the way we talk to and we teach our, our medical students, uh, how they, sh how what kind of interactions uh, they should have, and, and start modeling for them. I mean, everybody unfortunately comes to medical school. I mean, we know that a substantial number of women come to medical school having experienced sexual harassment in college and in their lives. I mean, and they've all 
seen and experienced gender harassment. I think after the Me Too movement, men are starting to more quickly recognize what gender harassment is and becoming uncomfortable in situations where dirty jokes or snide comments or, or, or things of denigration happen. So I think all those things are, are areas that we need to work on. Uh, but I think, yeah, there's this particular culture in, in medicine that's very difficult, very different than, than law and than the other professions. Can I just add one thing, um, Tim? I, I think that that's absolutely correct. You know, we did as part of the report, and I think this really speaks to Reshma's research as well, part of our, uh, the research that we had done, which is also very unusual for these reports, but we had qualitative research done with uh, those who had experienced sexual harassment. And there's nothing like actually hearing the stories and hearing why. And there is one particular story that, that, that really sticks out in my mind, and that is of a woman who had been harassed during her training. And her feeling was that because there is an, an expectation of some level of inhumanity in training, that she assumed this was just part of what was to be expected. And I think it does speak to changing the paradigm, changing what, what the way we do talk to our trainees, medical students, as well as those in, in postgraduate training, and how we change that paradigm and really take to heart at every level the oath that we all take, right? The Hippocratic Oath is first do no harm, and that should be do no harm to each other as well as to our patients. So um, I think really changing that and, and really thinking about that deeply. Let's go to an audience member. Hi, thanks for wonderful presentations. I'm Lisa Harris from the OBGYN department. Success in academic medicine depends on uh, a lot of things that we need to do outside of our institutions, presenting our work at national and international meetings, having success uh, with grant funders and study sections and uh, having outside letters of recommendation. That really complicate when, when um, sexual misconduct behaviors happen outside of our institutions, in particular professional meetings, that complicates uh, the paths for success in many ways. It complicates reporting. It uh, complicates channels for advancement. Can you speak to some of those complications? Um, yeah, so actually the, this takes me back to the academic astronomers, right? So the academic astronomers found that they were having problems particularly at their national meetings and that there would be a woman standing at a, at, at a poster and she would be harassed by a guy with a glass of wine who's the only person who could write her letter for uh, promotion and tenure, right? And she had to make nice with that person and yet was in a very awkward environment. And, and the interesting thing that, that Dr. Johnson, this Dr. Johnson, has brought up um, to me in the past is that um, um, hospitals share many of the characteristics of those conferences with the easy availability of rooms and the sort of the late off-cycle hours, but those professional society meetings can be very challenging environments, and there have been um, very compelling commentaries written, Annals of Internal Medicine, um, a, a very compelling story shared um, about uh, how a woman has now been avoidant of all networking opportunities. And we know how important networking is, is to get uh, ahead in our field. So um, we need ways to address this. And I think the astronomers have done a, a marvelous job of creating the astronomy allies. So I, I put the slide up there. But they, what they do is they have pins. They have these buttons that say that they're allies. And they actually let people know that they are available to help. And so not only do the buttons sort of call attention to the fact that people are watching, but the buttons also mean that there are senior women in the field who actually will make their um, cell phone numbers available. And so if you're standing at a poster board and you're being harassed, um, you can say, I'm so sorry, I was supposed to meet someone. Um, I'm going to just, let me just text them and I'm having a, a really important conversation with you because obviously you're the leader in my field. So let me just get out of this. And I text my ally, I, you know, Paula Johnson, please come to poster board 56. I need help. And Paula Johnson walks up. And I mean, 
nobody's going to say anything to her, right? And she walks up <laughs> and she says, I'm sorry, I just have to steal her away because I, I had a prearranged meeting with her. And so there are these very, very well-positioned women who um, help to remove the target. And so this is, you know, one of the classics of bystander interventions is that you can distract the aggressor, you can remove the target, you can actually confront if you have enough um, power in the hierarchy. And they're not mandated reporters in these professional societies, but they do encourage people to report and they try to, they try to keep an eye out for repeat offenders so they can call attention to that. So I think we should learn from the astronomers. It, that, that is absolutely right. And you're bringing up a, a, a really, what is the role of professional societies? Because harassment does take place off-site. And more and more, I mean, it's one of the recommendations in the report, which is that professional societies must be held accountable. There are some, the Astronomy Association is, is one, but the American Geophysical Union, which actually there was a, the, the head of that, the administrative head of that was on our committee. There's a real movement in some of these professional organizations and in medicine, we must do this. And, and that's where I think about leadership again. Many of the leaders in academic medicine are also the leaders of our most important professional societies. So I think as we think about changing culture, I see them as very much connected. Another audience question over here. Yeah, you, you mentioned that when patients are the perpetrators in sexual harassment that you can put something on their chart and maybe put them to a new institution. I'm just curious, like, how often does that actually happen? And is this something you see commonly across the health system? So I, I think that one of the major one of the major aspects of the report is focusing the light on the challenges that we have with patients and families. And uh, I think we're just kind of starting to develop ways of doing that. I think it's going to be a little bit difficult because I think we need to treat very differently a senile old man who does something that's part of his dementia as opposed to maybe the son of somebody who's in ICU who's physically aggressive and totally inappropriate. Uh, I think the other thing is that we need to really look at what's going on in our hospitals. And it's not just, I mean, this, this report looked at academic faculty because that was what our focus was. But we need to look at nurses. We need to look at hospital staff uh, and, uh, and, and, and kind of figure out how we're going to engage hospital security, how we're going to engage administrators. I mean, there has to be a strategy. When a medical student is harassed or when it's a nurse is harassed, they need to know who they can go to immediately. Uh, they need to know where they can get help. They need to know how they can diffuse the situation. Uh, they need to know how they can assure that the patient continues to get quality care and also that the staff be protected. And I think we're going to start working on those things. Uh, there's a new policy that's working its way through this organization. Uh, the rights and responsibilities of patients is being amended to include language about sexual harassment. And I know hospital security is being uh, retrained in terms of how to respond to these things as well. But it's not always going to be comfortable calling hospital security. If you're a medical student, you might want to call your resident and say, hey, I need some help. And we all need to learn strategies on how to help. I mean, I know if, if a medical student had come to me when I was a resident and said, I need help to do this, I would have been totally kind of unprepared to do anything like that. And we need to prepare people in the organization to be supporters, to be bystanders, to be able to provide that kind of support and to be aware of what's going on, right? At the middle of the night, there are not that many people there. So the residents need to be aware of where the three female medical students are and that one of them has been missing for a long period of time. You know, Tim, it makes me think about the fact, and, and I think we talked about this during uh, the deliberations on the report, which was that it's very clear from the data that scientific fields, sci fields of science in which there is field work are at the greatest risk. So that's why the American Geophysical Union or the Astronomy Association, um, those areas where they're taking uh, graduate students or, or undergraduate students off onto a field site are at some of the highest risk. Well, if we think about academic medicine, our hospitals are kind of just, they're really large field sites. I mean, it's where we train, but they are really large field sites. And they're large, complex organizations. And you have the, the added dimension, obviously, of patients and families. So I think if we begin to understand that much of what is seen in these areas with uh, these, these disciplines, with field research, that we have a similar issue that we need to be taken, uh, you know, the, the, the hospital environment almost as 
you know, um, obviously connected with the medical school, but a very different ecosystem. Hi, I'm Claire Duvonwa. I'm a cardiologist, um, chair of the Women in Cardiology section for the American College of Cardiology. And I wanted to speak to the role of professional societies. Cardiology is a very male-dominated field, as you know, Dr. Johnson. Um, and um, in my role as WIC chair, I've heard a lot of really harrowing stories from especially trainees. Um, we have, we've had forums at national meetings where young women have uh, told their stories of really horrifying, um, all the way from sexual assault to just being constantly belittled and not given opportunities, um, for example, in the cath lab. Um, and the college really does not have a good way of dealing with this other than hearing their stories and offering support and sort of every everyone who's there in the room after a stunned silence saying you know we're with you we've struggled for ways to respond we we do have an ethics and compliance um committee but but it turned out after one particularly horrific story that there really wasn't any avenue for doing anything about it within the context of that committee. And certainly as Women in Cardiology Section Chair, I don't have any formal mechanisms for how to do something about this. Um, as you all said, there's a culture change that needs to happen, especially in cardiology. But I wonder whether you have any other thoughts about how to deal with um, issues like this. But let me just... So one of the suggestions of the committee is that sexual harassment be treated like uh, research, uh, in, it's part of research integrity. And I mean, clearly if somebody from the American, Cardi College, American Cardi Card College of Cardiology knew that there was somebody who was engaging in plagiarism or research dishonesty, they have a mechanism of identifying the, the, the responsible people at that person's institution and letting them know. I think that's what we need to do for sexual harassment. I think if you hear somebody that says so and so is happening at the cath lab at such and such a place, that you should call the chief of cardiology, you should call the chairman of medicine at that institution and let them know anonymously what happened, uh, but let them know that they've got significant problems in the cath lab. I, you know, the cath lab is just like, is an isolating place, right? You take somebody down to the cath lab at two o'clock in the morning, you take somebody down to the radiology department at two o'clock in the morning, and all of us know what that's going on. So I think there's a responsibility for professional societies to report. And I think we should report sexual harassment just like we do plagiarism and academic dishonesty to the leaders of academic institutions. And that means the dean or the department chair or somebody like that. I, I, I agree. But I think there's, there, there, I agree. And there's also, I think, an opportunity at this moment in time. You know, it was interesting. When we started the work on this report, the Me Too movement hadn't started. And um, it happened as we were doing our, our work. And I do think that it is a moment in time when we can gather leadership to truly make it different in the future. And what do I mean by that? You know, if I think about the ACC and the AHA, that's the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association, so those are the two powerhouse professional organizations for cardiologists. There have been women who have been heads of both of those organizations, and there are good men. And I think that this... Um, issue has not been raised to a level of really garnering support at the top, moving it out of the women in cardiology unit, but you being the leads, but moving it out of there and really saying, okay, we need the allies who are going to come with us and make this a major issue for us within our professional societies. Professional societies are nothing without us. We pay dues to them. And I think that if we really take back that level of power, um, we can actually make a difference. And, and I do think that this is the moment. Um, because with what is happening in our country, for it to be ignored would be, I think, a major stain. So I think it is the time. And I'd just like to add, I was a sociolegal scholar on the committee, and I spent a lot of time thinking about the different legal structures and obligations that each type of organization is under. And the professional societies are quite a bit freer than, you know, say, a university with all of its tenured faculty and all of the burdens that may come with, say, separating a tenured faculty member. But a professional society could remove someone for a calendar year 
right? And that's a heck of a lot easier. So there's actually, if you think creatively, and from my perspective, I see the professional societies as having many, many more opportunities and being much more free in the legal environment. Um, so and I certainly would hope to take advantage of that. I'm just going to add one thing to that, Anna, because remember, too, we are now seeing a movement for certain funders to say, we are expecting, it is now the rule that you report to us um, those who are in violation. So NSF has really just come out with a new policy. This is really almost revolutionary. Um, as we were writing the report, we, you know, we had gotten wind that they were moving towards it, but they've actually made the step. Now, NIH has not, but with NSF making that step, I don't think people are going to want, I mean, you know, the, you don't want to be left out of the much more progressive, forward-thinking um, organization. So I think that once we again begin to understand the connection between sexual harassment and the integrity of research, of research, that is, as Tim said, an area where I think we do have some real leverage. The next question is from Associate Vice President for Research, Jack Hu. Um, so first, I, I want just to comment that NSF did come up with the uh, conditions for accepting awards. So if uh, we encounter sexual harassment or someone harass uh, colleagues or students, we have to report. But uh, Dr. Pollard Johnson, I do have a question about reference letters. I think it's a great point that you mentioned. So when we search for faculty, we usually go out and ask for a number of letters, and we have very prescribed questions about research, teaching, and service contributions. How can we ask a question about whether a faculty candidate had harassed others? Uh, what is a recommended language for us to reach out to colleagues around the country and the world to ask a question about that particular topic? So this is an area that is you know, is really just emerging on how we actually do good referencing. And I would say it's not done in as we are thinking about tenure letters or letters where we're looking for, you know, the traditional pieces of information that we need to make those decisions. Although kind of it putting in, you know, whether or not you're a citizen of the college or a citizen of the university and actually stating what that means and what that doesn't mean, and making it very clear, I think, would be helpful. So that's one thing. But I think it gets to um, really when you're hiring and beginning to think about what is your referencing for hiring. Um, you get the traditional academic letters, but then there's the need to probably go to HR departments and actually understand what a history is. And that's, I think, an area where there's been a lot of unevenness um, there are some areas, I said Wisconsin was one, that really um, is thinking about a very different mode. There's another, and I can't remember where it is, where they're actually asking candidates to sign, stating that they have not been found in violation of sexual harassment policy. Now, that doesn't answer the immediate question on referencing. What it does say is that if you find out something later on, then you can you actually have grounds to say that you were not truthful, but you know right now we're in this complicated uh, phase where a lot of confidentiality agreements were signed. So even if you do go to HR, um, sometimes you're not going to get the answers you expect. So I think this is going to be an evolution until we have some general pattern of one refusing to create confidentiality agreements and then figuring out how we navigate with regard to either a waiver or how we ask direct questions of HR departments from prior institutions. Question on that side of the room. Hi, uh, I'm Lori Sherhart. I am the assistant director for STEM for the libraries, and so my view is a little bit broader for of medicine. I'm thinking about nurses and all of the uh, allied staff and everyone that works alongside of physicians. Um, and I was really excited by a really trivial thing maybe that uh, Dr. Paula Johnson said about um, HR departments beginning to um, not um, agree to agree to not disclose violations of egregious actions or violations. 
And I think that sends a really wonderful message about what large scale institutions can do. Um, and another thing that I think we could do as a large institution institutionally is take a look at compensation that isn't related to uh, any claims of sexual harassment or other kinds of harassment because um, we have practices, as we're aware, where we often ask candidates for positions about their current pay. And this um, kind of question perpetuates, you know, pay inequity. And it generally is true that it's the people that are more on the receiving end of sexual harassment who are also on the end of the lower end of the pay scale for similar work. And I think that even though I understand the, the reasons that we do that as an institution, I think that we have to be very careful about the message that we're sending about the, the equivalencies and the values of other people that we hire. We, we just shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> it's because, because of just of what you're saying. And I think that um, we should be developing a pay scale based on what we believe a value of a position is, should not be based on a person's former pay, because you're right, we will just perpetuate the inequity, which is in a way probably what we've done for quite a long time. So I think you're absolutely right. And there are policies, I know at our institution, we do not ask that question, um, and it's a, it's, it's a blanket rule, you do not ask. Um, and but I think more and more that's going to become standard HR policy, and it and it should. But I think we can start, even if it is an institutional policy, we can start with our own areas, our own areas that we each have control over, to break the cycle. Go to Dr. Epstein. No, thank you. Um, so um, I just wanted to say, too, I'm Wellesley class of 99, so I'm really excited that you're here. Um, but I wanted to ask um, all of you about your thoughts um, with regard to support for um, students who are um, marginalized in multiple ways. So I'm thinking in particular of the students I advise who are first generation. And so there's a lot about the structure and the institution that they don't know in terms of accessing support and help and what they can do. Um, and also students of color. Um, and then if they're both first generation and students of color and also on the receiving end, um, you know, supporting students and really making, um, making opportunities for support um, available to them, um, you know, sort of within their reach. So I don't know if you have any thoughts about that um, in terms of, you know, yeah. It's, it's a very, very important point. And um, the report very specifically, and Lilia talked about it in, in her introduction, we very specifically looked at this question of intersectionality and, um, there's uh, there's bias on so many levels. Um, so we know that women of color are more likely to experience sexual harassment. Um, if you think about anybody with vulnerability, first generation students, you know, I think that when it intersects also with being a racial and ethnic minority, that's another issue. But, it, but even without it, there's a certain level of vulnerability that that, that uncertainness of being first and what does that mean and fright it's a frightening experience when you're in a very strong power dynamic so i think we have to be aware of those power dynamics another set of another group are sexual minorities the rates of harassment for sexual minorities is um, is the same as for women um, and the percent is higher though. So it is, it is really any of these groups are more vulnerable and it's frequently not recognized that they're more, more vulnerable. In fact, for women of color, there's a perception that they don't experience sexual harassment. So there's kind of the, the, the perception is diametrically opposed to the fact. So these are issues that as we train and really counsel um, our students, these are things we have to be very acutely aware of and why it's so important that the power dynamic in medicine, whether it be in research or in the clinical setting, be better diversified. 
because when you're dependent on one person, that is the perfect setup for trouble. The mic in the back there. Um, hi, thank you for so much for this presentation and opportunity to hear from everybody. Um, I'm Elaine Pomerantz. I'm in the Department of Emergency Medicine, but I also have an appointment in the Department of Pediatrics. And I'm listening to this, and I'm married to an astronomer who's been involved <laughs> in equity for women in astronomy for a long time, but astronomy is a small field. And um, it's a much more homogeneous field in terms of how people do their work. But in medicine, we're talking about all these different departments and all these different disciplines. And there's a lot about power and the power of different departments, and the power of men versus women. Um, and it's very complicated. So the, um, um, my colleague who spoke about cardiology, where she's a woman in a field of men and how that can play out um, is one issue. But there's also the issue of um, I'm in a department where almost everybody is female in medicine, in pediatrics, and I'm in a department where almost everybody is male in emergency medicine. And there is a huge difference in the cultures of those departments as there is between emergency medicine and our um, consulting surgical specialties. And sometimes the, I think that there's derogatory remarks or condescension that could be sexual or it could be interdepartmental, but I think we have to do, address this at a level of professionalism that transcends all of that. And I don't think we do a good job of that. And I think medicine is such a big overarching thing and it's got so many different cultural biases within it, if that makes any sense. Just my piece. Um, yeah, I completely agree. And, and by the way, thank you for taking care of my kids broken bones in the ER. But, uh, <laughs> Um, we do have so many different subcultures, and one of the things that's really important, and one of the things that we're doing here at our own institution, um, with the support of our leadership, um, you know, Carol Bradford has been incredibly supportive of an initiative that um, Professor Cortina and Dr. Johnson and I and a professor in the psychology department, Isis Settles, um, have been working on to try to understand how these experiences actually differ from department to department within our own institution because there's heterogeneity, as you've mentioned, across specialties, but then also across individual institutions. And so diving deep and understanding what the behaviors are is incredibly important. And as we all know, it's incredibly hard to get physicians to respond to surveys. Um, and so we have this tendency to ask, you know, abbreviated versions of what once was validated, but we'll cut off just one question because we can tack that onto something else we're already doing. And yet, this is such an important issue and such an important moment that we have an opportunity that we're actually, we have already surveyed faculty, house officers, and students. We will be surveying uh, nurses and other staff. And we're going to try to understand more about those subcultures, about the ER, about the OR, about the inpatient wards, um, so that we can understand not simply what types of behaviors, you know, there's the, the validated SEQ, the sexual experiences questionnaire um, that was developed in, in studying uh, the Department of Defense, but it has been, it's a 16 item questionnaire already already that's the abbreviated seq is 16 items right and then we have to ask it once for professional interactions and one for you know with with colleagues and staff and then we have to ask it again for interactions with patients and patient families so that already gets to be 32 items and that doesn't even get us to the actual nuances the qualitative nature of the worst or the most ex recent experience the setting the environment what could have been done the predisposing factors the reporting experience and so we're trying to get at all of that and we actually have a reasonable response rate and some data from our own institution and with the support of our leadership we're going to have targeted intervention it's wonderful that we're coming up on our lcme accreditation and this institution truly treats that as a process of true quality improvement and so we will have done exactly Exactly what the report says to do at our own institution. We will have measured and gathered data specific to our institution, and then we will thoughtfully target interventions, and then we will measure again, and we will target more interventions, and we will measure again. And so I'm, I'm glad we're here. So I, I think this, I think this, I mean, the, the, the report was very focused on academic science, academic engineering, and academic medical centers, and really focused on universities that do that work. When you think about medicine, and you think about the fact that it's not just university academic medical centers, but teaching hospitals affiliated with community hospitals, and probably even most hospitals that aren't even teaching hospitals or training hospitals have the same hierarchical structure. So the number of people in medicine across our country 
that are exposed to this culture of sexual harassment is mind-boggling. And uh, I mean, how do we how do we deal with it? It's is 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 going to be a, a real challenge. And I think it's up to the academic medical centers to start the process, and then realize that we need to speak out to others. I mean, the, the committee was very focused in terms of where what our scope was, but I think we need to do this work at the community hospitals, teaching hospitals, um, because clearly the same kind of dynamic is going on there as well. Oh, it should be on already? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Very technically savvy. Um, hi, I'm Raj Mangrulkar. I'm in the Department of Internal Medicine. Um, I'm also Associate Dean for Medical Student Education. I want to thank you three for really incredible work and the whole panel for um, really highlighting and, and shedding light in a really academic way for a very important cultural subject. Um, I was wondering, I was reflecting on the stat of how, Reshma, you talked about that there was very little change in 30 years on some of the, on, on some of the behaviors. Um, and you really, I think what, what arose was a very interesting observation that even those of us, uh, those of us that are responsible for educational programs, we're not only um, bringing in students who are being harassed or a part of this culture, but we're also training students who may go on to become harassers. Um, and I was remarking that a lot of our discussion about reference checking and about how um, we try to assess whether someone who walks into our institution may have carried a record with them that we would find unprofessional, um, we're always looking backwards. We're always trying to check back. And we know that academic medicine, whether we're in the PhD track or the MD track, is filled with these transitions between pre-medical and UME, UME to GME, GME to fellowship, fellowship to faculty, or pre-candidacy to candidacy, et cetera, et cetera. So I'd like us to, uh, I'd like you all to reflect a little bit on the concept that was raised earlier about this being a core competency and our obligation as educational institutions to feed information forward rather uh, that about students, learners, trainees, or future faculty members who actually may exhibit behaviors that are, that may place them in a category that we may not want in our profession because they contribute to the problem. And um, what, are, what are our obligations around that? How, what kind of movement are we seeing in the academies around the feeding forward rather than always need, needing to check back and reference check? Um, so I think that we um, absolutely need to regard this as a core competency. I think that there have been interventions that have been developed to promote civility and respect. As, as, Dr. as Professor Cortina said, um, a respectful environment by definition is not going to be a harassing one. And the, this has been demonstrated in hospital settings. So there's a study in, ca in Canadian hospitals um, that has actually demonstrated the impact of intervening in exactly this way. So we have a responsibility to engage in civility and respect training as part of, uh, of medical education, and then indeed to define this as a core competency upon which we evaluate. And I think that was the, the point um, that was being made earlier about how we ask questions about other competencies in our professional reference letters, and we, we highlight you know, education and service and research, and we don't ask a question about integrity. And I think that we have to now make it more routine to actually integrate that into our formal evaluations, because as we do that, we do change the culture. We've got two mics out, so I'm going to ask just, one. just one. OK, we've got one last, one last question, and then uh, we have a lovely reception waiting outside for us at 530. Where's our last person? <clears throat> right yeah, here. There I'm okay. Carol Bradford, Executive Vice Dean for Academic Affairs. Uh, probably a bit more of a comment uh, than an absolute question, but I did want to give our sincere thanks to the panelists. It's been just an incredible, insightful, educational afternoon for all of us. I wanted to com uh, comment briefly upon uh, our deep commitment to advancing this arena forward on many, many fronts. Paula, thank you for your comments about not signing confidentiality clauses. I really feel that we owe an obligation to future institutions who might employ people, 
whether they be learners or faculty, and those are my purview, and I think it applies to all who have had issues and been specifically found responsible uh, by our Office of Institutional Equity that we don't sweep that under a rug, uh, but yet uh, let future institutions know of the concerns raised. I would also add uh, for uh, faculty and learners found responsible uh, in our own institution for um, uh, matters from the Office of Institutional e Equity. I would also add uh, internally we do not sweep things under the, um, the rug. We address those in confidential ways in terms of the outcome. But there actually is a, a good public report that um, one of the, our institutions report just came out and so there's getting to be better and better closure of the loop. Um, consequences can be anything from dismissal, termination, to remediation depending upon the severity of the matter. Um, and it's just, you know, you know, culture, culture, culture. Um, I've written about culture of respect, culture of civility. Um, I grew up uh, in this system, uh, a surgeon uh, in a field where there were few surgeons. Um, so I deeply, deeply understand and appreciate it. And we'll all you know, this isn't going to change overnight, uh, but it will change. The best way to handle, I think, um, incoming faculty and potentially learners, but particularly faculty, is uh, asking faculty to agree to off offline or off-list referencing. We do that for all of our leadership searches, and we have found out, um, you know, that's where you just ask people what is this faculty member like? Uh, it's a great question, um, and I would be very concerned if a faculty member did not agree to offline referencing. I'd be very concerned about hiring that faculty member. So before you get into all the legalities, it's a very simple question that we ask people applying to important positions here as faculty to agree to. So I just, um, extraordinary work. Uh, I've learned a lot and we appreciate all that you are doing. With that, I think we'll adjourn to the atrium outside where there's a reception and we can all continue this discussion. Thank you so much to our panelists. <laughs>